Welcome to the Advanced Tech Podcast. Joining me today is my friend, Tone Vase. Hey, Tone, how are you? Hey, Alex. Awesome. Uh, great to be back on. I think it's like the third or fourth time you're interviewing me. So uh, always happy to do your interviews. Awesome. Cool. So for my guests that don't know you, could you talk a little bit about your, uh, give us a brief intro and talk a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, so uh, my background, uh, I guess we can start with me uh, joining Wall Street which was in late 2006, early 2007, just in time for the financial crisis, where I saw I had a front row seat to watch it from the Bear Stearns office, which was one of the big casualties uh, during that time. Uh, a few years prior to getting that job, I learned how to trade, and I really fell in love with technical analysis. Uh, I was just out of college. I didn't have much money, so when the opportunity came up, uh, to work in corporate Wall Street, I took it. It was uh, good money, a uh, great learning experience. And I stuck around, uh, worked those jobs. I uh, worked at four companies during a 10 year stretch. Uh, after that, I really wanted to start trading on my own. So I quit my job in very early 2015 uh, to do trading. Uh, but I discovered Bitcoin around, well, I discovered it in 2011, but I didn't get in until 2013, 2014. So it was just a hobby and an interest. Uh, but in 2015, I started uh, writing some articles, I started a blog, and then I started public speaking, and that kind of took off. Uh, so the time to uh, trade slowly started to give way uh, to the time for ev uh, uh, evangelizing Bitcoin. Uh, so here we are today. I have a pretty popular YouTube channel. I travel the world, not at the moment, as you can see by my background, uh, stuck in isolation, waiting for the halving, which is only three days away now. Uh, so with all the clocks. And, uh, uh, but normally I travel the world. I speak about Bitcoin, try to make people understand it. And uh, even though I don't really have too much time to trade these days, I am now while in isolation. Uh, so I try to educate people about trading, try to teach them uh, risk analysis and be more responsible traders, be better at technical analysis. Uh, so I teach trading. I talk about Bitcoin both on my YouTube channel and in person. Lately, my YouTube channel has been more focused on the price of Bitcoin, but it also has law shows and news shows and some interviews. So it's, uh, it's fun. I really finally enjoy what I'm doing with my life and I have for the last five years. Awesome. It's good when you can be in that place. Very cool. Um, so I'd like to dig into your YouTube channel. So you recently had some issues with YouTube uh, where they basically canceled your channel. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, the, what was that like? Um, and how did you fight it? Because you got back fairly quickly. Uh, yes. So, uh, so before I answer what was it like and how did I fight it, let's talk about why it happened. And... Uh, ironically, about two or three months earlier, I did a, a YouTube podcast on YouTube about why people are getting banned from YouTube. And I was joined by two other YouTubers that have done research in that field. And we basically talked about uh, three parts. We might have gotten to a tangent on the fourth, but uh, YouTube implemented a bunch of rules all at the same time. Uh, and... Uh, one of those rules was uh, like the child protection uh, laws that came in, uh, where if your video is made for children uh, and uh, there is a little bit question of what is the definition of a child? Is it less than 13? Is it a teenager? So there was, and these rules are very vague. So if your video is meant for children, you are supposed to mark the video as meant for children. Uh, if you do not mark your video as made for children, uh, and it's made for adults or teenagers. Teenagers is that gray zone. But YouTube determines that, you know what, your content is actually geared towards children. And there's so much gray area there. Like if a father and a 10 year old are doing stuff like uh, playing around with electronics or things like that, is that geared towards children or adults? Because if just because there is a child, it's more likely that other children will watch. So um, all these laws came in that they had to abide by. Uh, then also, uh, they started being way more enforcing on, uh, I guess, making fun of other people. So if you're a public person, uh, it's okay to be critical of that person. 
But if you're not a public person, if you're just a regular person, uh, apparently, you know, uh, you can't like make fun of them or you can't be mean to them or critical to them. And again, there's so much gray zone there that you don't know what's going on. And then finally, and this is the one that probably is most effective, is that if they catch you promoting regulated content or you promoting something regulated, your channel could be uh, shut down. So things like if you are promoting alcohol, for example, or gambling, uh, there could be laws there because you're promoting something that is very regulated. And this is where uh, maybe trading or exchanges come into play. If you are promoting an exchange, does that count into regulated content, a regulated field? It's mostly for like to prevent marijuana and like cigarette advertising, things like that. And um, all of these like rules came in at the same time. They have bots that try to identify which channels get shut down and won't. Now, in my particular case, what sounds like what happened was I have a lot of haters on the internet, especially from say the Ripple community the Ethereum community, you can name your shitcoin and they hate me. So uh, apparently from what I understand from YouTube, uh, my videos got like mass reported as being harmful and dangerous. Uh, and uh, the default algorithm uh, kind of trusted the mass reporting that my videos were harmful and dangerous, but they don't specify why they're harmful and dangerous. And I got a warning and then the, later that day, I just had my channel deleted. So how did I do to solve, what did I do to solve this problem? Well, the advantage that popular YouTubers have, uh, I'm not gonna say I'm a popular YouTuber, but having almost 100,000 subscribers on YouTube and 200,000 followers on Twitter, you know, goes a long way. So I tweeted out, hey guys, YouTube just shut me down. I appealed, this could take, you know, weeks unless people start retweeting and, you know, giving YouTube a hard time. And people did. And YouTube uh, reviewed my channel, obviously a lot earlier than they otherwise would have. And this is where the smaller YouTube channels don't have this advantage. But in a way, I don't think this is unfair because if my channel has a hundred times more viewers than somebody else's channel, my channel getting shut down is a lot more important to more people and to YouTube itself if it's done erroneously than someone with very few views. So I should be like, there should be like, you know, tiers of uh, clients uh, that are streaming on YouTube because it's their ad revenue too. I mean, they're profiting from the ads on my channel versus someone that doesn't have the viewers. So it was my, it was the community, it was my fans, it was those that watched me that helped get this looked at sooner than later and they reviewed my channel and within 24 hours, uh, they gave it back to me. They said there was no violation, everything is okay, uh, and um, I'm back to normal. Now, what would have happened if uh, I never got my channel back? What would have happened if they determined that my content actually is harmful and dangerous and I should not be streaming on YouTube? Well, uh, YouTube isn't my main source of revenue. Uh, YouTube is a small source of revenue because I never got into YouTube for the YouTube ad revenue. Uh, if you are getting into YouTube for the ad revenue and to profit from it, I can tell you right now, you are going to be extremely disappointed to the point of you're never going to do it. You get into YouTube to do stuff that you want to do. And if then you, if you do it well and you become popular, there is a lot of revenue to be made there. Now, YouTube does help me bring in revenue. YouTube is where I advertise other things, my conferences, my workshops, um, other services. So that would have greatly suffered, but my 200 uh, Twitter followers uh, is still pretty good. So even if I had no YouTube, but um, I wanted to uh, continue doing uh, what YouTube did for me, I could just do it on Twitter or I could start streaming somewhere else. Uh, also, me personally, I, I don't know how long I'll stay in this blockchain space. I mean, as uh, my popularity grows, it makes me want to stay here longer. But I do have other interests, uh, nutrition and uh, health and fitness. And even though fitness, I haven't been doing much because I'm so busy with the blockchain stuff. But I would <laughs> love to, you know, uh, change professions again, go into the health and fitness area, 
Uh, maybe have a start a different YouTube channel, uh, you know, for diet and nutrition. So something like that. Of course, I would have to go uh, get another master's degree. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm I, right now everything I'm building is from my financial engineering master's degree that I got almost 20 years ago now. But uh, uh, but I would love to go back to college and get a degree in something I actually like. When I was getting my financial engineering degree, I was doing it for the money because I was a high school teacher before I went for that degree. And I said, I'm not going to be teaching kids that don't want to learn. I hated it. So I'm like, what, what degree can I get that's going to get me a high paying job? And uh, now that I'm in a, a different stage in my life, what degree can I get that I can actually do something good to the world? Uh, even though I feel like I'm doing that by educating about Bitcoin. Uh, so that's uh, kind of what I would have done, uh, why it happened and how I got it back so quickly. Awesome. Very cool. Um, I think that's really good advice for, for people that might be going through something, uh, you know, either they're building their channel. What advice do you have for people that are currently going through an appeals process where they feel that they're, they've been unfairly targeted? What can they do? Uh, just keep, keep, like, keep harassing YouTube, like keep tweeting at them, uh, keep, uh, uh, you know, appealing, keep messaging them, you know, uh, uh, keep writing emails, uh, Starting another channel is tricky and difficult. Um, consider other avenues. Consider uh, YouTube, YouTube's competitors. Uh, you can now, uh, like another thing that I would have done is if I didn't get my YouTube channel back, but I wanted to do it, uh, this would give me time to look into something like uh, Restream. Now, Restream is not a streaming service, but it's a middleman that lets you stream to you know 20 or 30 other places like you can stream to uh facebook and twitch and uh twitter and god knows what else things i've never even heard of so right now i'm comfortable with youtube just like i'm comfortable using zoom to stream to youtube but uh this would give me a chance to step back uh create accounts with every possible streaming platform and the next time I come back to streaming, I'm going to stream everywhere, uh, just completely everywhere. And then if any one of those gets shut down, I don't care. Uh, just stream everywhere and see which one is giving you more popularity. And then you can focus on that one, uh, tailor it more towards that audience. So I would completely restructure because we do get comfortable with streaming on YouTube. I stream in a, a certain way. Uh, it's a comfort thing. I don't want to take a week or two weeks to learn uh, a new platform, to learn a new streaming service. But if I didn't have my uh, YouTube channel, I would have the time to learn that other stuff. So don't see it necessarily as a giant negative. Uh, see it as an opportunity to come back with a vengeance on newer platforms like TikTok is becoming very popular. Uh, I mean, I don't stream there, but if you are first to a new platform, uh, that could give you a lot of staying power, but you don't wanna choose the wrong platform and focus on it while, uh, you, while that platform gets outcompeted. Uh, but if you start streaming everywhere and then you see where you're popular, that could give you a huge advantage. So the, you should always look for a positive in every situation. That's very fair. I think it's important that you mention, you know, it's, it's not the, YouTube is not the only platform. There are many other platforms. And I, I think when we start looking at um, the platform kind of dictating what's possible, I think that's a problem. So um, yeah, I think looking at uh, areas where you're perhaps owning your content or hosting your own content, um, I think it's really compelling. Um, so based on everything that happened with YouTube, um, I want to touch on free speech and essentially, you know, in your opinion, why is free speech important and what did you learn from this whole process? Uh, so, I mean, you know, the biggest thing I'm uh, learning, it's not even that process. It's uh, what we're seeing with COVID is a lot worse uh, to free speech than banning, uh, you know, my YouTube channel. Uh, free speech is incredibly important, and it's so disappointing uh, what's going on where everything is being censored left and right. I mean, who cares if Tone Base's YouTube channel got censored? He talks about trading. He talks a little bit about Bitcoin. But 
um, when you start to censor, you know, doctors that are professionals in their field that don't happen to agree with consensus of other doctors, uh, that's when it gets really, really bad. Like it's one thing to censor someone that doesn't have any expertise, but it's so bad to censor someone that actually has credibility. It's just because uh, his um, viewpoint is different doesn't mean that it's wrong when that person is an expert in the field. So, uh, this, the, and that's that second part that people confuse. Uh, so for example, uh, I mean, I don't wanna bring it back to Bitcoin. We can talk about any subject. Like people think that some random high school dropout knows better than a PhD. The, I will take the PhD any day of the week. Uh, like nine, hundred uh, percent, like a hundred percent. Like I will take my chances with that one high school dropout being uh, smarter than a PhD. Uh, I'll, I'll never do that. I'll never, I'll, I'll never take that back. But uh, just because you have 100 PhDs in field X, um, I will listen to the minority that also have expertise in that field because they understand the field. They're not some random person. They are experts. And this is the kind of censorship that is just so bad and uh, could be so destructive, destru destru uh, destructive going forward. So the censorship that is happening over this is horrible. And uh, YouTube is front and center, uh, Twitter to a slightly lesser extent, uh, Facebook is pretty bad, not as bad as YouTube. Like when uh, the YouTube CEO comes out and says that anyone who disagrees with the World Health Organization is going to be banned is ridiculous. I mean, it's one thing banning a random person, but it's another thing if that random person is interviewing experts in the field and you can validate that they're experts in the field just because they don't agree with the World Health Organization. So this kind of censorship is really, really bad. And if anything causes like the end of America, it's this. It's basically going against the constitution like the uh, it's like ridiculous like freedom of speech that's what we have freedom of religion uh like that that's what they have like the anyway um going against the first amendment going against any of the amendments especially the original amendments uh, going against those is really really bad yeah we don't have a i'm actually not sure we don't have a constitution like uh, like you have in the states here in canada um, and I guess we do have the illusion of free speech, but realistically, I mean, we're seeing so much, um, so much, so much censor censorship uh, worldwide that, um, I mean, even if we did, uh, we may as well not, which is unfortunate because I, I think Canadians are, we're kind of almost conditioned to be a little bit more accepting and just, you know, trust the authorities and um, I kind of look at what we've experienced through the pandemic and we've had, um, we're not under an official lockdown. We've been kind of encouraged to lock down, um, and so we have. But uh, yeah, I, I definitely, I, I definitely appreciate the the American, um, I guess not fight, but the ability to and the the willingness to stand up for for rights uh, that but, you know have been written. Um, but let me just add something to that, right? Like the government is supposed to be defending your free speech, yeah. not you. And this is the problem. YouTube was at once its own company. Now YouTube is owned by Google. So Google is a huge company and Google provides you with a platform for you to speak. And the government needs to follow its own constitution to make sure YouTube doesn't censor you from that speech because YouTube is a private company. Like if you own a private blog or if you moderate a chat group, you can censor people. It's your chat group. Technically, technically, YouTube and Google are within their right to censor uh, anyone uh, because they're a private company. But it's the government is supposed to, uh, you know, police its own constitution, and they're the ones that are supposed to tell Google and YouTube, no, 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 you can't censor people unless it's actually. Uh, they can't censor opinions, like unless it's something 
uh, potentially like dangerous or criminal. So uh, basically the government is not following its own constitution to protect your uh, freedom of speech right. Yeah, it's, um, that's very concerning. Um, so I could talk probably for hours <laughs> on this, but I, I know you're kind of pressed for time. So I wanted to ask, uh, what are you working on? Well, first of all, before we dig into that, um, how are you coping with the pandemic? So at first, uh, it was actually, uh, it was good because my life was very, very hectic, traveling city to city every week, uh, coming back to a single place and relaxing and uh, uh, wasn't bad. I'm constantly around people, so it was good to take a mental break and not be around people for a while. Uh, but, you know, staying in this long does start to push your mental boundary. And uh, for me, I've been doing a lot more YouTube videos. I've been fine. Um, you see the number of days in isolation. Uh, like, I wasn't uh, inside the apartment all those days. I think between five and seven hours, cumulatively, I have gone outside. I did some shopping when I first arrived from South Africa, which is where I was. Almost got stuck there. I could have still been there. I got out 12 hours before international travel was, uh, was stopped between uh, the US and South Africa. Uh, and so I was out of there just in time. And uh, I just went shopping early on uh, a couple of times, uh, went to, uh, uh, you know, uh, met a few people from a safe distance early on, but uh, pretty much for the last month, for the last 30 days, I have not left the apartment at all. Uh, so uh, it's time to get out. It's time for the country to open up. Uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it was maybe the right thing to do at first, but now it's pretty clear that you're not going to stop this virus. It's probably going to have a wave two and a wave three, and everyone will eventually catch it. And the best thing that the government could have done from day one is say, you need to get your health together. Uh, like, I'm not concerned uh, too much of catching it because uh, if you're in good health, it has very little effect, uh, long-term or short-term. Uh, I'm more worried about giving it to someone else that isn't healthy. And uh, that's the problem. So like the problem has always been uh, people's diets and uh, not exercising and not eating right. That's, that's the real problem uh, because these pandemics will come and go and uh, there'll always be another one and you can't shut down the world economy for it. And I think a lot more people will probably die due to the trillions of dollars that have been lost globally, businesses that aren't gonna open, supply chains and food chains that aren't gonna come back and some people will starve. Uh, just, uh, it will be, there'll be a lot more damage longer term. And, uh, I don't want to sound too insensitive, but yes, if you are older and you're not healthy, you may want to isolate yourself and stay away and have your food delivered. Hopefully you have kids that will deliver your food for you. And you may have to stay indoors for like years because of this. If you are older and you think that the disease, this disease will kill you. Uh, but otherwise like the amount of younger people that will be damaged by this is a lot more, uh, it's a lot worse for the world over the next 10 years than someone in their 80s. No offense to those in their 80s. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I definitely can echo that same sentiment about um, seeing all of the other fallout effects um, beyond just, you know, like beyond the lockdown. Um, it's concerning uh, to see I mean, first there's the economy, and I mean, obviously the economy is, is secondary to health, but when it's, uh, when it's prolonged, I think we've got health effects that are definitely there as well. You know, you've got um, just gross misjustices uh, to people's freedom and, um, you know, the ability to, like, we're essentially, I've said it a few, a few times before, we're essentially all prisoners right now, whether we like to believe that or not. You know, we're all under house arrest, whether it's officially mandated. And to be, uh, to not have the ability or the freedom to move for whatever reason, good or bad, uh, it definitely takes a toll on people. And I think we're going to start seeing some of the fallout from that going forward. Yeah. And what concerns me the most is, uh, like, if the, the government's seizing this power and making it worse, uh, just, hey, we can make everyone just stay indoors and not go outside. What else can they do? 
And this is how tyrannical governments start to form. They feel like they have all the power. Like when you're watching people get arrested for being on a, like in the water uh, at an ocean with nobody around them is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I mean, that person is uh, doing the greatest social distancing they could and they're getting arrested for it. It's just, it's, it's really bad. And I've said this before, if, if, this isol if, if the government in the US forces this isolation to go into June, there's gonna be massive civil unrest against the government. And that doesn't end very well. Yeah, I think, I think that sentiment is felt world, worldwide. Um, I believe anyway. Um, I don't know, I, I, it seems like people are, you know, at the very beginning there was a lot of unknowns, but I think now that we're starting to get better data, we can start making better decisions. And um, that, uh, that will hopefully prevail. Um, so what are you most looking forward to uh, when this pandemic ends, when this lockdown ends, and, and do you think it will? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it'll definitely will. Uh, in the short term, I'm just looking forward to having a barbecue with my friends. Uh, we're already planning it either next weekend or at worst Memorial Day weekend, which is in about three weeks. Uh, just get together. Uh, I've done my part. I've stayed away from, I haven't had any human contact with another person for over three weeks now, probably close to four. So I know I'm healthy. Uh, so hopefully uh, my friends are as well. Uh, seeing family again. Uh, that's what I'm really looking forward to in the short term. Uh, in the longer term, I just want to see, you know, people get their, like, I don't want to say power back, but uh, there is this power dynamic between uh, people and those that rule those people, which is the government. Uh, and the sooner people can get some power back, the better it is for everyone in the world. Uh, so I also can't wait to see travel open up again. Um, I do miss travel. I need to be a little more strategic about my travel. My travel has always been too hectic. I don't stay in places long enough. It's always been, I want to see the most amount of cities uh, so that I know where to come back to and enjoy. Well, I've been traveling like that for three years and maybe it's time to go back to the places I have enjoyed and actually spending some time there. So going forward, when I do travel, it's not gonna be three days and move on. It's gonna be a week to two weeks and just you know uh, rent a nice Airbnb apartment and relax in a place, even though it is a different place, every few weeks now, instead of every three to seven days. Nice. Yeah, it's nice when you can, uh, I've had the opportunity to travel uh, pretty extensively the last couple of years, and it's been nice to see more of the world, and it's nice when you can have the additional downtime. Um, well, we were to... hanging out in Greece. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, and it was, it was fun, but uh, it was disappointing for me because I was only, I only had time for about four days in Greece, and we got out one day to see some sights, and it was awesome. But you don't go to, uh, but what you learn is you don't go to Greece to spend three days in Athens. Uh, you know, you got to go there for two weeks and you got to go to the islands. You got to spend at least one week on a beautiful Greek island. And that's what I need to start doing. So the next time I go to Greece, it's not going to be for three days in Athens. It's going to be for at least 10 days and maybe the front days in Athens and the back days in Athens and the in between seven days, rent an apartment pick an island, go somewhere nice, and enjoy. Awesome. I had the opportunity to go to uh, Spain shortly after, so I had an additional week so I could explore a little bit right at the tail end of summer. I saw the last bit of summer in the Mediterranean, which is fun. Um, so speaking of last things before they were ending, <laughs> you threw uh, the second running of Uncon Unconfiscatable uh, back in February, and uh, that was probably one of the I think the last uh, big Bitcoin event that happened uh, in real life. How was that? Um, how did it compare to the first year and uh, any insights? You're right. That probably was the last big event of the year. Uh, wow. I should check that. I, I should double check on that. Uh, I did speak at another event in South Africa two weeks later, which is why I was in South Africa. But yeah, Unconfiscatable, looking back at it, man, we did that conference right before the coronavirus broke because when I was speaking two weeks later in South Africa, people were already very concerned. And uh, at the conference, they were saying, hey, many people didn't make it uh, because of coronavirus. And they said, hey, guys, try not to shake hands. 
Uh, even though I was shaking hands with everyone, uh, I seem to have done okay. Uh, this was back in early March. But uh, Confiscatable went great. It's so awesome that we were able to do it. If that conference was a month later, it would have been horrible. Like I would have had to refund everybody's money. Uh, it would have been rough. I did have to cancel the financial summit uh, that was going to take place in the Caribbean uh, in April. It would have been uh, last month. Uh, but that's a much smaller event. Uh, it only has a maximum of 30 attendees. Uh, we had uh, several attendees signed up but they agreed not to even take the refund and to just go to the Bali version of that event in November instead. Uh, so that was great. So thank you everyone, if you're watching, uh, that was supposed to go there. But the event went fairly well. No, one, As far as I know, no one canceled because of the virus because it was just a little too early. I mean, we just, we got it in just in time. So we're very fortunate, very lucky. The event went great. Uh, you were there. I actually right? wasn't. Not for this one. Well, you, were, was, you, were, you were gonna be there. I was gonna try to be there, yes, but I couldn't. Okay, last you minute. didn't make it. Okay. Uh, the event was absolutely excellent. Uh, can't wait to do the next one. Awesome. Um, will there be so? Assuming the travel ban, hopefully it's lifted um, sooner rather than later. You know, in a in a safe manner. <laughs> ah, there we go. Unconfiscatable. Cool. Um, if if we're still not able to travel next year, um, would you consider having a virtual format or like a VR? A lot of conferences are VR now. Okay, so uh, I am 99% confident we'll be able to travel next year. Uh, traveling, the traveling industry is, uh, and this is really fascinating actually. So there's only two industries, two professions that did not exist at all, uh, say 50 years ago, maybe 70. Uh, every profession besides two has existed for a thousand years, but there's only two that, have all, that did not exist a thousand years ago and uh, industries. Well, maybe not a thousand, but definitely like a few hundred years ago. And they're completely recent. And one of them is the computer programmer. Prior to the 1950s, 60s, there was no such thing as a computer program. They didn't exist. Uh, every other profession has pretty much existed. And the, the other profession is uh, tourism and the tourism industry. There was no tourism before cheap commercial airlines. It just didn't exist. Like you couldn't go anywhere. It would take you too long. If you have a few weeks vacation a year, where are you gonna go? Uh, even if you have a car, how far can you get? Uh, a ship, you're not going to go to Europe because it's going to take like a week to get there. So then you got to come back. Uh, but this is a brand new industry. And there are countries where half the population will probably be in starvation mode if, if tourism doesn't come back soon. Uh, maybe not countries, but certainly cities. So tourism is coming back uh, sooner than later. And probably sooner than later, they're going to have to open it up because they're going to have riots on their hands in some of these other countries. Because uh, if next month I can go somewhere, I probably would. I usually spend my summer in the U.S. anyway because of the nicer weather. Uh, but if uh, next month was, say, November, I would be out of here. Uh, but next month happens to be June, which is when I'm usually home, June, July, August, and then I leave in September. So uh, the moment September rolls around, I plan to go back to Europe if they let me in. Uh, the moment October, November rolls around, I plan to go to Asia if they let me in. December, I'm usually in South America. Again, I like the warm climate. So I'm not too concerned about that. As far as me putting together a virtual conference, no, because I put on a virtual conference every day. I already have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, speaking of, uh, we're going to pretty much have a conference on Monday. On Monday for the having, I am going to do an eight-hour live stream, and I will keep it going as long as I can. Uh, and I'm going to invite like 100 people, and they can come in anytime they like. We're going to have like four or five people at the same time. Hopefully, 50 people are not on at the same time. Uh, but I'll manage it. So it won't be the first time. I've had 12 people on at the same time before. It's, it's manageable. It's not easy. 
so that's pretty much like a conference. But no, I'm not going to organize a virtual conference. Uh, I only do the, the in-person conferences. I already showed Unconfiscatable. Uh, there is also uh, Understanding Bitcoin in Malta, of which, we're still, which we moved. It was supposed to be in May. It was supposed to be this month. Uh, we moved it to the first week of October. So we're hoping people can get to Malta the first week of October. And because it's all about the in-person interaction. Um, I already have uh, a channel for virtual interaction. Uh, so there's no reason for me to organize a conference there. But uh, again, that's a special case. And a lot of people are organizing these virtual conferences now. And I've spoken at many of them. And I find it very frustrating because I've spoken at some of them. And they're live streaming it and they're getting like 20 viewers, 50 viewers. And the first thing that comes to my mind is why, why am I spending time? I can stream on my own channel and have a thousand live viewers right now. And I'm doing someone a favor and I'm speaking at your virtual conference and no one is there listening to me. Like, why am I doing it? So everyone thinks it's so easy to put on a conference and it's not, uh, it's really not. They're not that profitable. Uh, if at all, uh, unconfiscatable actually lost me money. It didn't make me money, uh, but I do it for the passion and, uh, you know, people loved it. So I'll, I'll do another one, uh, but it, it's not easy. Uh, it's not that rewarding, uh, unless you really love the field that, that you're putting together. Uh, so for me, it's a little different. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I think for, for virtual conferences, I think it's good in that we're still able to meet, um, you know, be it virtual or in person. In person is always better. Um, but at least, you know, there are some there are some steps being made. Some people aren't going completely crazy um, on their own, <laughs> stuck in their own apartments. Um, but yeah, I definitely hear you with, uh, with a live event and, you know, with your YouTube channel, you are meeting with people virtually. So um, what are some of the highlights that people can look forward to for your live stream? for the having live stream? You know, I don't even know. Uh, one of the reasons why I'm a live streamer is because I, I should be more organized, but it requires a lot of prep. We'll see who shows up. Uh, certainly Jimmy Song will be there and we're gonna talk about the technical side of Bitcoin. Uh, the lawyers are gonna be there. We're just gonna talk about everything. Uh, like whoever comes on, uh, I'm inviting anyone that has an expertise in a certain field. Uh, I got to text some miners. Uh, if you have an expertise, uh, you'll be welcome because we're going to ask you about that expertise. Uh, if anyone in the, the where our, my channel is more, uh, I like to refer to it as a shitcoin minimalist channel. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not planning to invite anyone from the altcoin space. Uh, if they happen to show up, we will be, of course, be critical uh, of why they're doing what they're doing. So I like to bring on experts in the field and just ask them. We'll have developers, we'll have other traders, uh, we'll hopefully we'll have a miner or two, and uh, we're just gonna talk about you know the huge anniversary of Bitcoin. This is now uh, what twelve years, may almost twelve years. Havings are a little bit ahead of time, uh, but if a having comes every four years, this is the third having. So this should be a twelve-year anniversary, but it's happening uh, a year early. Uh, which is very, very interesting. We're just going to talk about everything, anything Bitcoin, uh, just going to have a good time and hopefully people will join us. Awesome. Yeah, this will be my first halving. So uh, I've not experienced uh, previous halvings before. Yeah, we did this for the last halving. It was on the World Crypto Network. I was streaming back uh, on the World Crypto Network back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sure they're going to have their show. Everyone is having their show. It's going to be a fight for audience. It's going to be a fight <laughs> for speakers. Uh, and I, again, my show is a little bit different. I'll stream myself. Uh, if I'm getting a thousand viewers, just myself, it's going to be great having some people on, uh, they can come on anytime they like, there's no plan. There's no set schedule. I'll just manage it as best I can. It'll, it'll just be fun. We're just gonna have a good time. Awesome. Very cool. And there's two events that I'm involved in around the having. So I'm part of the, I'm moderating the team Satoshi fitness challenge. Uh, which is uh, <laughs> should be really fun. We've got athletes uh, athletes from all around the world, uh, and I think you're part of Team Satoshi, at least the group. Uh, I know, I know. I <laughs> well, we'll see. Maybe uh, uh, maybe you can join uh, during my channel and uh, make everyone that happens to be on at that time do one of the fitness challenges. Uh, well, you you and I will talk offline about that. Awesome. That sounds good. 
yet um it should be good uh, there's also value bitcoin which is going on um moderating a couple of things but i think there's a few things going on i like the idea of you having a longer uh youtube stream and uh it's eight hours that you're planning on or... um you know i'm not putting a cap on it i don't even know what time it's going to start it's going to yeah. start um several hours before the having and i'll keep it going i'll keep it going as long as i can as long as i can and as long as people are watching like the moment i see people tuning off that means it's not important uh and that was and that was the make or break like when i tweeted out uh hey my youtube channel is done I, it's up to you guys now like i'm not gonna fight for my own youtube channel like it's uh you guys watch me uh you guys gotta fight for my channel you have to want to bring it back uh if no one is fighting for me to get my YouTube channel back, why am I gonna fight for my YouTube channel to get it back? Uh, uh, so it's the same thing here. As long as people are watching, I will give you the best content I can uh, because I am here for those that are watching. So we'll start um, several hours before the having, and we'll keep it going as long as I can, as long as people are watching. But yeah, I had to cancel on, uh, on the other conference that you just mentioned. Uh, and. Uh, unfortunately, because of the having, They tried to plan it uh, a week before the having, because the having was supposed to take place later, but uh, a bunch of hash power came online and the having is now sooner. And uh, that's why I can't uh, be there. That's fair. Um, what else was I gonna ask you? There are a couple other questions. Um, so everyone I'm sure is probably curious about your price predictions, uh, what's gonna happen to Bitcoin. Um, so that might be a good place to, uh, to close things. I've got actually two more questions after, uh, what are your price predictions for Bitcoin, uh, for right up to the having, uh, shortly after the having and like up to 2022. Sure. Let me, uh, take a look at a chart right now. Wow. looks like we're back to 10,000. Very, very interesting. I'll do a quick screen share. Cool. And, um, here I am looking at the daily chart. I did expect us. This is the longer term version that I look at. I expected us to get rejected around 9,500, which we did last week. And I expected us to pull back uh, a little bit. Uh, however, uh, the market has been resilient and the having pump is still happening. So at the moment, I still think that we are around a topping process. I am looking for a top somewhere between right now at 10,000 and say the having itself. So somewhere between now and Sunday night, I am looking for prices to form a top and pull back down. Uh, I am, however, fully bullish in the market. I want to make that clear. I've been fully bullish in the market since the crash back in March, and I've been saying buy all dips. Now, I had a short-term trades in the market as well. I did not sell any of my hodl position. I would never short Bitcoin in a bull market. And I believe Bitcoin is finally in a bull market after two years, after two and a half years of being a bear. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, not two and a half, two years and a quarter uh, of being a bear. I became a bull right here near the lows. And I exited my short-term trade on Bitcoin around 9,000. And now I'm waiting for a pullback to maybe 8,000 area sometime over the next 30 days or so. And I'll enter more long trades into Bitcoin. And if it doesn't pull back and it keeps going up, great. That's why the majority of my Bitcoin is in a hodl position. Uh, so right now I am just looking for a top in this area and uh, buy the dip uh, when it comes. Uh, awesome. That's basically my outlook on the price. Very cool. Um, so one of the things I wanted to get into, everybody always asks about the price and, you know, why should I be interested in Bitcoin and what's it at now? And, you know, oh, it's, it's really volatile and you've got all the, all the criticisms. Um, but Bitcoin has really strong fundamentals. Um, could you talk a little bit about that for people that are not familiar uh, with Bitcoin as an asset? What makes it a good asset? Oh, absolutely. Bitcoin has incredible fundamentals. That's why I fell in love with Bitcoin uh, in 2013, even though I heard about it in 2011, early on 2011, when Bitcoin was probably no more than a dollar or even less than a dollar. And uh, I fell in love with Bitcoin because of its fundamentals. 
uh, because in 2013, something happened in Cyprus that completely changed my entire outlook on what you need to do with your life savings. Uh, when I watched the banking confiscation take place in Cyprus, when they confiscated 50% of your money, if you had over 100,000 euros, just to bail out the European banks, uh, that bothered me. And I said to myself, if that can happen in a developed nation uh, within the Eurozone, that can happen anywhere, Australia, Canada, even America. So I immediately started to think, how can I protect my money? And protecting it with gold is also not great because, and I, and I had some gold at the time, I was already buying gold, uh, but how do you store your gold? Your gold can always be confiscated. They can come and take your safe, burying it in the backyard isn't exactly secure. And Bitcoin was the only solution. And that once again brings me to the concept of uh, Bitcoin being unconfiscatable. And that is the reason why the conference is called unconfiscatable, because that is the most important property of Bitcoin. It is the first time uh, humans have ever owned something of value that could be considered unconfiscatable if you properly protect it. That property of Bitcoin for me is the most important hands down. Uh, the second most important property of Bitcoin is its censorship resistant value transfer. Uh, the ability to send that Bitcoin anywhere in the world and no one can stop you and no one can stop the person from receiving it. It's not always gonna be fast. It's not always gonna be cheap. It's not always gonna be uh, fully uh, private. Uh, all these things will get better over time. Uh, but those uh, three things that are uh, necessary for Bitcoin to fully function well, they're not as important as your ability to send something and someone else to receive it without anyone interrupting that transaction. And the third most important fundamental property of Bitcoin is its hardness. It is the hardest asset, meaning that uh, it has the most optimal stock to flow, even better than gold. Maybe not yet, but in about nine months, it will be, uh, where uh, no matter how high the price of Bitcoin gets, you can't create more Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a finite supply of 21 million Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin uh, scales very, very well, so you don't need to create more Bitcoin for Bitcoin to be uh, the global reserve currency one day, perhaps, hopefully. Uh, but these three properties of Bitcoin uh, is what allows Bitcoin to compete with any other store of value or payment method, even today. Uh, and over time, it's going to compete better and better and better. And these fundamentals don't exist in any other cryptocurrency. And they don't exist in any other currency. It's just going to be Bitcoin. It's the only one that matters. It's the only one that's actually decentralized. And I have presentations on this, and this is the kind of presentation I do all around the world. And this becomes very important. My biggest catalyst for shooting Bitcoin to the moon, as you see it in my graphic, is something like the breakup of the European common currency, the Euro. If it breaks up into its individual components or a few countries leave or get kicked out, uh, that's gonna send masses of people into, the, into, in, into Bitcoin. Uh, also, uh, the potential of uh, the elimination of cash. Uh, the US do physical dollars probably aren't going uh, away anytime soon because the physical dollars are used globally. But if you're Canada, if you're Australia, if you're a lot of the North European countries, uh, even Japan, uh, like eventually your paper money is going to go away. And when it does, uh, you will want a cash alternative and Bitcoin will be it. So these are the giant catalysts that could send Bitcoin literally to the moon overnight. Awesome. Yeah, I think people that um, have been in Bitcoin long enough uh, and are kind of Bitcoin only really understand, you know, it's a, it's a new paradigm shift. It's, uh, it's money. Uh, it's something of value that we've not seen, like you mentioned, um, really ever. So uh, that's definitely what keeps me in it. Um, so I wanted to ask if you have any, uh, as a final question, if you have any questions for our viewers um, or listeners, and if so, how can they reach you? Oh, so I'm not easily reachable, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can certainly watch a lot of my content. Everything is tone based. Tone based is kind of the brand. Other than the conferences, 
Uh, I'll run through the conferences one more time. Uh, so we have um, Unconfiscatable that takes place in Vegas, usually in February. Uh, we have Understanding Bitcoin, which normally takes place in uh, around May, uh, but we've moved it to October. Maybe we'll keep it that way going forward. There's also the Financial Summit. I don't have a background for the Financial Summit, but that's the one that takes place in Bali, Indonesia, and the Caribbean. Uh, it's every six months. It's for professional traders, hedge funds. It's a very small event, maximum of 30 attendees. It's also a lot more expensive than the others. Tickets for Unconfiscatable were only $250. Uh, tickets for the Financial Summit are very, very expensive because they're designed for the professional trader, high net worth individual. Uh, and of course, you can catch me on my YouTube channel where we stream law shows. Uh, occasionally, I make fun of altcoins. That's my never ending battle against Ripple. Uh, and uh, we do talk price quite often. Uh, and so you can find me on YouTube, you can find me on Twitter. I'm also on Instagram. I don't have as much of a presence there. So everything is pretty much tone based other than the conferences themselves. Awesome. And do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners or viewers? Uh, if you could tell uh, people in, in Bitcoin or who are curious about Bitcoin one thing, what would that be? Don't get fooled by imitations. Don't get fooled by fake Bitcoins. If someone is selling you gold uh, for $300 an ounce and the value of gold is $1,700 an ounce, you're going to be skeptical. Be the same way when it comes to cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. If someone's trying to sell you something that's better than Bitcoin, but it's worth pennies, when one Bitcoin is worth $10,000, there's a reason for that. So be skeptical. Don't fall, don't fall for imitations. And uh, uh, there are a few content creators uh, on YouTube, on podcasts that educate you properly without a hidden agenda. Uh, if you want to meet a bunch of them, uh, come Monday, just check out, come to the Tone Vase YouTube channel. We'll be streaming all day and I'm going to bring on the best guests I, guests I can. And if those guests are a little bit sketchy, I will certainly challenge them live on air. Awesome. Very cool. Thanks, Tone. I appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to put this out earlier, so it'll actually be out for uh, in time for the halving. It's going to be a couple of probably a couple of weeks before it goes up on all podcast channels, uh, but you'll be able to see it on YouTube. And thanks again. I really appreciate your time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. You bet.